So this time I'm going to talk about uh, sentence and contextualized word representations. And I think this was uh, one of the very exciting developments in NLP uh, recently. Um, and specifically for sentence representations, I think you've seen this slide before. Um, but from a sentence, we can create a vector um, or we can create a sequence of vectors. So like this is an example, uh, will become a single vector for the entire sentence or uh, will become a sequence of vectors for the entire sentence. And you know, we talked about attention and encoder-decoder models where the vanilla encoder-decoder model turned everything into a single vector um, and the uh, attention turned everything into a sequence of vectors. And uh, Ray Mooney, you, you, you had this last time, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so the goal for today um, is to talk about how we can kind of create general purpose uh, representations. Uh, and this is in contrast to what we had previously, which was where we train a model uh, specifically to do a particular task like machine translation or response generation, et cetera. Um, and in order to do this, I'm going to introduce tasks uh, where you can use these general purpose representations, uh, data sets uh, that you can use to train them, and also methods and models that you can use. Um, specifically different training objectives and also talking about multitask and transfer learning, um, which I, th I think are uh, important topics. So the first topic, um, the first thing that I want to talk about is why you would want a sentence representation in the first place, um, specifically why you would want a sentence representation that consists of a single vector. Um, and the reason is similar to why we want uh, a word representation. Uh, so I gave some motivation uh, with respect to word representations where I said we want to know if the, the word is a, a noun or a verb or whether we want to know two words are similar. Um, and the same thing goes for full sentences or se uh, sequences of words. So specifically, where could we use these and what are some practical applications? I think um, sentence representations actually have much more practical uh, application than uh, simple word uh, representations. And these include things like sentence classification, um, which we've already talked about, but you can do with uh, general purpose sentence representations as well. Also things like paraphrase identification, where you want to identify multiple um, sentences that mean the same thing. Uh, semantic similarity, uh, this is like paraphrase identification, but it's not a, uh, it's kind of like not a one, zero one judgment, it's a continuous judgment. Entailment, uh, which is a um, which is kind of like paraphrase identification, but uh, a little bit different. I'll cover that, and also retrieval. So um, this can also be like paraphrase uh, mining or something like that. So for sentence classification, this is what we've been talking about uh, so much that you're probably very tired of it. You know, uh, we classify sentences according to various traits uh, like uh, sentiment or subjectivity, objectivity, uh, topic. Uh, whatever. So, you know, I, I think everybody, you're already doing a homework on this, so I don't need to really talk about it uh, much more. Um, what I should mention is that, you know, if you have a very strong uh, sentence encoder, you might be able to create a vector that you could then feed into a sentence classifier, uh, which, you know, would learn much more efficiently uh, than other cases. And I'll give some, uh, some examples of this. And then moving on to things that we haven't really talked about uh, in quite as much detail, although maybe to a little bit, um, uh, to a, a small extent, um, we have paraphrase identification. And this is identifying whether A and B mean the same thing. Um, an example of this is the Microsoft paraphrase corpus, um, which basically uh, consists of sentences that have been extracted from news articles that mean more or less the same thing. So one example of this is Charles O. Prince, 53, was named as Mr. Wheel's successor. Uh, Mr. Wheel's longtime confidant, uh, Charles O. Prince, 53, was named as his successor. So these kind of say more or less the same thing. The main content is the same. So you would judge these as being uh, as paraphrases. And um, kind of saying exactly the same thing is, is too restrictive. And basically, you would only have exactly identical sentences to mean exactly the same thing. So you have a kind of a, a, loose, uh, a loose idea of similarity. Another task is uh, semantic similarity and relatedness. 
Um, some examples of this are uh, the semantic text similarity challenges, uh, I believe, from Semivel. So there's a bunch of these challenges that try to measure uh, textual similarity. Um, and specifically, what this means is you have um, an example of two sentences, and then you need to calculate a relatedness score where a man is jumping into an empty pool, there is no biker jumping in the air, uh, would get 1.6. And then as you get down to things like a person in a black jacket is doing tricks on a motorbike, a man in a black jacket is doing tricks on a motorbike, uh, these are judged as very similar. So this gets to be 4.9. Um, this is much, I guess, vaguer than paraphrase, paraphrasing, but it gives you kind of a continuous judgment about how similar things are. Um, there's also other data sets like the SICK data set. Uh, the SICK data set is specifically designed to try to fool these systems. Uh, so it has kind of like before the word adversarial was a big word in machine learning, it was creating adversarial examples for this uh, text similarity where they tried to come up with examples that would fool uh, kind of simple systems that didn't have any concept of, uh, of actual uh, like synonyms or antonyms or stuff like that. So textual entailment, um, which also recently has uh, been called natural language inference, um, is essentially a, a task of taking two sentences um, and judging whether they entail each other, uh, do not entail each other, or uh, are kind of neutral sentences. Um, if you went to the uh, LTI colloquium last week on Friday, uh, you might have seen people talking about this, but um, or Tal Linson talking about this, but. Uh, um, basically, uh, entailment is if A is true, then B is true. Um, and uh, the woman bought a sandwich for lunch, and the woman bought lunch uh, entails the woman bought lunch. And this is uh, not paraphrasing, uh, a paraphrase identification. Paraphrase identification is essentially judging entailment in both directions. So um, A is entailed by B, and B is entailed by A is kind of the definition of paraphrasing. Uh, contradiction um, is if A is true, then B is not true. So the woman bought a sandwich for lunch uh, would contradict the woman did not buy a sandwich. And neutral is cannot say either. Um, the woman bought a sandwich for lunch. Uh, you can't really say whether the woman bought a sandwich for dinner is true or not. So this is kind of a neutral, a neutral sentence. So um, a lot of these are kind of uh, sentence pairs. Um, and I already talked to some extent in the CNN lecture about models for sentence pair processing, but you can actually come up with uh, even simpler models uh, where you basically calculate a vector representation for each and feed the vector representation into a classifier like this. Um, so you take uh, this is an example, you take this as an, another example, uh, put it into a classifier and, and spit out a class. Um, and then the big question becomes how do we get such a representation? What is the model that we use or, or whatever? Um, another thing, actually I forgot to mention it on the slide, it's also very common to take the difference between the vectors or take the dot product between the vectors. Um, and this just makes it more uh, easy for the classifier to learn. You know, like if things are very, very similar, then the difference will be very small. So that's a good indication that um, uh, the thing, uh, you know, it's a paraphrase or something like that. So are there any, uh, are there any questions about, uh, about this so far? So these are all potential tasks that you could use, uh, you know, if you're interested in them. Uh, uh, and a lot of them have, uh, have data that either exists on the website or that you could find easily by searching for, through the references that I have for today. Um, so the big kind of meat of, the, of what I want to talk about this time is uh, multitask learning or uh, pre-training based objectives for learning these sentence representations. And um, there's lots, um, you know, all the learning that we've done essentially up until this point is single task learning where we have a training data set uh, of inputs and outputs and we want to predict the output given the input. Um, but uh, multitask learning is a general term for training uh, where we don't have a single task that we would like to solve but multiple tasks. Um, so one example of this uh, would be you have a, uh, a sentiment objective and a uh, sentiment classification objective and a topic classification objective. So then you take the you know, sentiment classification data set and the topic classification data set and you train on both of them and try to get a better encoder uh, or something like that. 
Um, transfer learning uh, is a type of multitask learning. Um, but the idea behind transfer learning is that we only really care about one of the tasks. One of the tasks is a task that we really want to solve, but we train on another task and transfer whatever we learned from the other task that we trained on to the task that we really care about. Um, there's also a domain adaptation, which you might hear uh, quite frequently. And domain adaptation is a, a type of transfer learning. Um, where the output of both tasks is the same, uh, but the input uh, data distribution or the type of topic that you're handling or genre that you're handling is different uh, between them. So uh, an example of this would be uh, sentiment classification on, uh, on apartments and sentiment classification on mobile phones. Um, and th there's actually a really, uh, a really nice paper about this called uh, uh, what's it called? Boomboxes, Bollywood, and Blenders, or something like this, uh, from 2006 or something, uh, where they classify movies and they classify electronics and other things all in the same one. And a kind of interesting insight is, given the word small, is the word small a positive word or a negative word? And it really depends whether the word small is about an apartment, in which case it's negative, uh, or about uh, a, a cell phone. Uh, or you know something like that, in which case you know small probably is a positive thing because it fits in your pocket, for example. So um, uh, you know there's lots of interesting things that you can do within this uh, space as well. So we have lots and lots of tasks in NLP, um, and they each require different uh, data scenarios. So the um, uh, there are things like only text, uh, which include language modeling objectives. So the great majority of the things that I'm going to talk about this time are some variety of language model objective where we only require text. Um, also naturally occurring data uh, of some sort uh, that has slightly higher resource requirements. Um, one example of this is machine translation. So machine translation, uh, you can get naturally occurring data easily um, because, you know, Translators translate uh, all of the Euro par uh, European Parliament documents uh, from one language to another. So you can get lots of English German data or something like this. Um, but if you're creative, you can actually come up with lots of other ideas uh, for how to get naturally occurring data as well. Um, does anyone have any other ideas about how, uh, like, where you could get naturally occurring data that would allow you to train uh, something that would be useful uh, that's not just text? Anyone? Sub subtitles? What was it? Subtitles? Subtitles? Uh, from movies. And from movies and, and what would you do with that? Uh, you can like, uh, use them as translations. Subtitles? Uh, yeah, you could use them as translations. So that'd be another source of machine translation data. You can also use them for things like dialogue response generation, where you have uh, one speaker and then you generate the next uh, response. Uh, any, any other ideas, like for sentence classification or something like that? Like the comments from Reddit or this? Comments from Reddit. Or um, and what, what, would be, what would be like a label that you could use for that? Uh, also maybe the machine translation. Oh, machine translation. OK. Yeah, you could use it for machine translation. But um, Amazon reviews. Uh, you can get an Amazon review, and then it has stars associated with it. So you can get sentiment analysis data uh, for free from this. Um, for you know something like uh, another example of this would be like um, you can use emojis on uh, on Twitter uh, and predict the emoji is a type of uh, like sentiment classification. Where if you have a smiley face, it's probably positive. If you have a frowny face, it's probably negative. Yeah. But, sorry. IMDb. IMDb. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's reviews. That's also like Amazon reviews, for example. So that would be a good place to get it. So if you think about it, if you're creative, you can come up with lots of different ways to get, uh, to get naturally occurring data. Um, but then um, there is also things where inherently it's pretty difficult to get any naturally occurring data that's 100% gold, gold standard. 
Um, so lots of things like syntactic analysis tasks, um, it's pretty difficult to get, uh, to get data uh, for this. So this you really need to hand create, and very often you need linguists to hand create it. So this is very difficult. Um, another thing might be um, uh, like medical, uh, medical diagnoses or something like this. And here it's really, really hard to get this data because number one, no hospital will want to give you this data for free because it's a very valuable resource for them. Uh, number two, they have to have doctors create it on their own. So, you know, there's lots of things where we have uh, useful, uh, you know, tasks where we just can't get these big naturally occurring data sets. And of course, uh, we need these in each language in many domains. Um, so the reason why we want to use multitask learning is to increase our data um, that we can use for these kind of low uh, resource tasks. Um, and so we can perform multitasking when one of the two tasks has uh, fewer data. And um, this includes general domain to a specific domain, so like web text to multi uh, medical text, a high resource language to to a low resource language like English to Telugu. Um, I won't be talking about this this time. I'll be talking about uh, multilingual stuff a little bit later. Um, and also plain text to uh, labeled text. So for example, we might take a LM objective and use it to learn a parser, for example. Um, and I'm mostly gonna be talking about the last one in, uh, in this time. So rule of thumb number two, um, we want to perform multitasking when the tasks are related. So this is kind of a I don't know, it's kind of a obvious in hindsight, but you might not necessarily think about it uh, at first. But if the two tasks are completely unrelated, um, then you're probably not going to get very much from multitasking. Um, so the reason, uh, an example of this is like, let's say uh, topic classification and, uh, and sentiment or something like that. Classifying the topic of reviews um, and the sentiment of reviews. And if you, if you can come up with a conditional, um, if you can come up with like a conditional probability matrix where you have the sentiment as being positive or negative, and the topic being any of a number of topics, if you have roughly the same number of positive and negative examples here, um, regardless of topic, then probably using this, uh, you know, y using one of the, or the other to do multitask learning isn't going to be very, uh, isn't going to be very useful. Um, you might still get lucky and get something, uh, but um, it, you, it's much better if you can intuitively think that in order to do one of the tasks, you will, um, uh, you'll have to learn information about one of the other tasks. So kind of um, a cool example of this, uh, where they thought about this uh, in, uh, in detail, is they had a human eye gaze data, where humans were reading with an eye gaze met, uh, reader on. Uh, and they took um, like where the eye gaze was moving throughout the sentences, and then they did multitask learning with summarization, with the basic idea that if you, um, if you have eye gaze uh, information, pe humans will skip over the less important parts of the sentence or they'll read them very quickly. Um, so, you know, they showed that this multitask learning works in this setting. That being said, I don't think any data source where you need to require humans to do eye gaze uh, is, uh, um, is going to be a very useful data source because it's very hard to get people to actually do that. But there's actually a trick that you can do to get this information, which is, um, Mouse movements over web pages are very highly correlated with eye gaze. So, um, if you're creative about how you get your naturally occurring data, you could uh, you could potentially do something like that as a, on a higher level as well. Um, so, are, are there any questions so far about what I talked about? Okay. So, um, standard multitask learning. Um, the the standard way to do it is to train uh, representations to do well on multi, uh, multiple tasks at once. So for example, uh, language modeling and tagging. Uh, within neural networks, this goes all the way back to Colbert and Weston, who kind of started the, uh, the big multitask learning, um, uh, or so started kind of neural nets for NLP, uh, the boom in uh, 2011 or so, uh, where they did multitask learning over a bunch of different uh, things. Um, 
In general, this is, can be as simple as randomly choosing a mini batch uh, from one of multiple tasks, although there's uh, you know, other ways to make this work better, of course, as well. Um, and, uh, but recently, uh, one thing that has been, uh, become very popular is pre-training, where you first train on one task and, uh, and then train on another. Uh, either using this as initialization or, um, or uh, just taking the representations out of it. And this is widely used in word embeddings. For example, uh, you know, Turian et al. in 2010 uh, you know, came up with this as a, uh, a way and all the other word embeddings that we talked about. Um, but recently, uh, there's been this move to pre-training sentence encoders or contextualized word representations, which I'm going to be talking about more. So um, starting now, I'm going to be going through a whole bunch of architectures and training paradigms for these sentence embeddings. Uh, but before I do so, I, I want to say something that I think is really, really important about these, um, which is there's a whole bunch of methods, and they all have really cool names. Um, and I, I blame this on the skip thought vectors paper because like after you come up with a name like skip thought vectors, uh, everybody else after that has to come up with a cool name, right? You've, you know, you've set the precedent. Um, so uh, we have skip thought, we have para NMT, we have Cove, we have Elmo, we have Bert, you know, we, uh, all, all these other kinds of things. Um, but when you think about these, the unfortunate thing about naming methods uh, a single cool name that explains your method is these refer to a combination of at least three different things. Uh, one thing is a model, um, which is the underlying neural network architecture. Um, so what model are you using to generate your representations? And even worse, this might refer to a model class and a whole bunch of architectures. So if you have like BERT base and BERT big, these are you know, the same underlying model architecture with different numbers of layers, different sizes of hidden layers, et cetera. Um, so when you give something a name, you know, one of the things that you're naming is the model. The second thing is the training objective. So what training objective are you uh, using to pre-train? Um, and there's lots of different uh, questions about which one you should be using here. And also data. Um, so if you're using a pre-trained model that somebody else has created for you, uh, remember that the data that they use to train the model is super, super important. Um, and if they trained it only on books, uh, if they trained you know, this model only on books, it's not going to do very well on Twitter, right? You know, this exact same model could be applied to Twitter. You could just do pre-training on Twitter, and uh, you, would be, you would probably be able to process Twitter pretty well. But if you're thinking about the BERT model or the ELMO model, um, think of, if you think about the data that they use underlying that model, uh, you know, it's very possible that it's a very biased subset of all the language that you could possibly get. Um, so the important thing to remember is that these are often conflated when you just say skip thought, uh, I use the skip thought model, or I use the para NMT model, or I use the ELMO model. Um, so make sure that you think of all of these separately and, uh, and consider the effect that all of these can have on your results. So given that, um, I will go to, uh, into details. Um, so another thing to mention is that for any of these models, or basically all of these models are end-to-end -end differentiable, so we could train them end-to-end -end, uh, for any task that we wanted, um, which is fine, uh, but we don't have very much training data. Um, and also very often we'll have uh, weak feedback from uh, like only the end of sentence for uh, text classification. So for example, one of the reasons why standard RNNs uh, for text classification where you just use the final state don't work very well um, is because this uh, weak feedback from only the end of the sentence uh, makes it hard to do credit assignment, et cetera. Um, so it's often better to pre-train the sentence embeddings on another task and then tune it on the target task. And that's what a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about here do. OK. Are there any questions before I go into the actual uh, architectures or things? Is that a hand or no? No. OK. <laughs> I saw you go like this. Um, OK, cool. Uh, so. The first thing I'm going to talk about is training sentence uh, representations. And when I say sentence representations, I mainly mean sent uh, representations of sentences as a single vector. Um, so the general model overview is, you know, we have um, 
I hate this movie as a sentence, we put some complicated function uh, to extract features. And sorry, this shouldn't say scores, this should say features. Um, so, and we extract features from it, and then we can do some sort of classification. Um, so kind of the, the seminal work in this area was by uh, Dai and uh, Lei, uh, 2015, um, called Semi-Supervised Sequence Learning. And um, as I said, everything is going to be a model, a training objective, and the data that they trained it on. So I'm going to explain about each of those as I, uh, as I talk about each of these models. So the model here was an LSTM. Uh, you already know what that is, so I don't need to say any more. Um, the training objective they used was a language modeling objective. So basically, they, uh, they predicted the next word um, at each point in the sentence. And then they get an encoder. Um, uh, they get an encoder. And then they use the final state of the encoder uh, as kind of the sentence representation. Um, they trained it on, uh, on either the classification data itself uh, so, like, if they wanted to do text classification and they had supervised text classification uh, data, they, um, they just used that data as is. Um, and then they also did a kind of transfer learning from Amazon reviews, where they had just the text of Amazon reviews, and then they uh, used the pre-training on Amazon reviews for, uh, to help the downstream task. Um, and downstream, uh, the way they used these was um, by initializing the weights of the encoder for the task they were interested in and continuing training. So basically, this is a pre-training plus fine-tuning regime where you fine-tune the, the downstream model. So um, they also had a, a different method that they tried in the same paper, which is an autoencoder-based uh, transfer method. And basically, the idea is from a single sentence, um, the only thing they changed was the training objective. And uh, from a single sentence vector, uh, they attempt, attempted to uh, reconstruct the sentence itself. Um, and everything else is exactly the same. They just you know, changed the objective. Um, and as a result, uh, they actually showed really nice, um, they showed really nice uh, improvements. Uh, this was a paper that was kind of before its time uh, you know, 2015 was before people were really doing this. I think um, there's a couple reasons why. Uh, one reason why this didn't really catch on is they didn't release their code um, and they didn't re release pre-trained models. I think another reason why it didn't catch on is because in 2015, uh, only Google had enough GPUs to train uh, <laughs> uh, all, all these models and they were at Google and, you know, nobody else, uh, nobody else could reproduce this. So I guess this kind of shows the importance of, you know, making a tool available to people. Uh, uh, in, in itself. But um, this was kind of uh, the first work that I'm aware of that really uh, did this in a uh, um, systematic way. Oh, so, okay, yeah, so the question is how, how did they create the data set? So basically, um, their first set of experiments, they just used the labeled classification data. Um, so they didn't actually use this as a method to get more data. They just used it as a method to initialize the, um, the, model, it's, uh, the model itself. So interestingly, this still really helps. And I think the reason why this really helps is if you go back to, uh, my uh, like end-to-end -end versus free training slide here, um, there's two problems, right? One, we don't have enough training data for the classification task we're interested in. The second problem is that our feedback is too weak uh, by just having a single classification label for the sentence. So they, what their experiments on training on the classification data show is that just by changing the training objective to pre-train, you can help solve the second problem, and that actually makes a big difference in sentence classification. The second experiments that they did, they took unlabeled Amazon review data with no, they didn't like use the Amazon stars or anything like that as, as supervised data. And um, they trained with that and they got further gains. And what that shows is that they, they were helping resolve the paucity of the training data problem. So basically they, they split their experiments into two parts and showed the advantage of doing both. So um, I, I think this is a, a really nice uh, piece of work that people maybe you know should 
uh, should have paid more, deten more attention to in hindsight. Um, uh, a piece of work that did become a little bit more popular was this um, uh, skip thought vectors. Uh, one, because the name is super cool. Um, <laughs> the, the second reason, you know, because they released their code uh, in pre-trained models and a lot of people downloaded this and used this. And um, basically uh, the idea behind skip thought vectors, the model is still exactly the same. Um, and uh, the objective is predicting the surrounding sentences. So the, um, the way it works is you take an encoder, you encode the sentence, you get a final vector, and then you have decoders that decode the surrounding sentences. You have one decoder to decode the previous sentence, you have one decoder to go decode the, the next sentence. Um, and this, uh, you know, this model, it's like the autoencoder, but it's actually a bit better, I feel, because you're not just in, uh, trying to reproduce the sentence itself, you're trying to you know, pick what is going to be happening before and after. So this is kind of a harder problem, and I feel harder problems give you, you know, better, more generalizable representations. Um, what they trained this on I, is uh, books. I believe it, it's um, the Google Books Corpus, or maybe just called Books Corpus uh, after this. And this is really important because obviously in order to train this model, you need to be able to have uh, sentences in context. So you need to be able to have uh, the previous sentence and the next sentence. And you can't get this if you just have you know, a bunch of shuffled sentences. So the final uh, offer of the sentence is the input, the first input of the sentence? Yes. And then the, the thing you actually use is the final sentence embedding is this thing here. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so this one, interestingly, you don't even need to decode anything. You just need to calculate the likelihood of the surrounding sentences. Um, so in maximum likelihood estimation for encoder-decoder models, you don't have to do decoding at all. You just feed in, you see I got back home. You just feed in I and got and back and home into the model. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons why training is much faster than testing for sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models, uh, because you can just feed in the ground truth. Um, we're gonna, uh, that's not a good objective, um, or there are better objectives for training like sequence sequence models, um, which we're going to be talking about later. But for the purpose of just maximum likelihood training, that's uh, plenty. Um, any other questions? These are good questions. OK. Um, so for downstream usage, uh, basically what they did was they, uh, they did things like um, uh, sentence pair classification, where they took the, uh, the vectors here, they took the difference between them, uh, the absolute difference between them and the dot product, and then they used these into uh, a sentence pair classifier. Um, another, uh, another method um, that I think is, uh, is interesting, um, it came out at about the same time as skip thought uh, vectors as well. Um, it's also by our, our own John Weeding here, so I, I should plug it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's paraphrase identification um, for uh, sentence and uh, learning sentence embeddings. Um, the model, they actually, one interesting thing about this paper is they actually try a whole bunch of different models. Uh, they try word averaging, they try LSTMs, they try uh, a deep averaging network where you take the continuous bag of words and run it through nonlinearities, et cetera. Um, but the objective is predicting whether two phrases are paraphrases or not from uh, the paraphrase database. So what the paraphrase database is, is this big database of phrases that are, uh, that are paraphrases of each other that is extracted from bilingual data. So basically what you do is you have an English corpus and you have a German corpus, and you take the alignments between lots in, of English sentences and German sentences, and things that translate into the same thing in German um, are probably the, you know, uh, paraphrases in English. So if you have a, a single word in German um, uh, and it's translated in two ways in English, that's probably a paraphrase. So this is a very accurate way of getting lots of data that is, are paraphrases of each other. So basically what they tried to do is they tried to identify whether two phrases were paraphrases or whether they were negative samples, essentially. So uh, things uh, that were not paraphrases that still existed in the mini batch. Um, and then in the downstream usage, they use this for sentence similarity and classification. Um, and 
the result, number one, this is a really good objective for training uh, sentence similarity models. Um, maybe that's not surprising because it's trained explicitly to identify paraphrases. Um, so I think it's still state of the art for sentence similarity uh, tasks. Uh, and interestingly, they show that LSTMs work well on in-domain data, um, but things like word averaging like super simple word averaging models actually generalize better to data that isn't similar to your training data. And this is a rare, um, this is a rare insight that you don't get in a lot of these sentence embedding papers. So I think this, this paper is very interesting, number one, because it proposes an interesting training objective, but number two, because it has this analysis across domains and across model classes, et cetera. So I definitely encourage you to, to think about reading this if you're, uh, uh, if you're interested in this. Um, so recently, this has been expanded to large-scale large paraphrase data, and the basic idea is simple. Um, you uh, do automatic construction of a large paraphrase database by basically taking a large parallel corpus between, say, English and Czech, and then training a Czech-English uh, machine translation system and translating all of the sentences into English. Um, and the... Um, uh, you get an automated score about how well the machine translation system is doing. So this is uh, a task called quality estimation. So you can tell like whether you, you believe that the MT system did a good job or not. And for the ones that are high, um, you annotate this sample as uh, English, English paraphrases. And then you train a paraphrase ID system. Um, and the corpus is huge uh, with 30 million uh, high quality things. Uh, uh, sorry, 30 million high quality sentence pairs. And the trained representations work very, very well. They're kind of state of the art on sentence similarity tasks again. So um, I, I think this is super simple. Uh, it's a simple method for creating data, but it's a creative way of uh, creating kind of paraphrase data where paraphrase data doesn't actually exist by you know using the fact that it's very easy to get a high quality MT system that will translate into things that are different than the actual uh, um, the actual input that you have. Um, so this is, uh, right now, um, so this is a, a good uh, thing. You can download the, the pre-trained model, et cetera, if you want a, a good pre-trained sentence of any model. Um, for um, entailment, uh, so now I'm going to move on to some other training objectives. So, um, up until now, all of the uh, all of the objectives that I've talked about have been things that you can easily get with, um, you know, kind of pre-trained, uh, pre-trained pre-training on uh, monolingual naturally occurring data like books or uh, naturally occurring bilingual data like parallel corpora. Um, an additional objective that people have used. Um, uh, and notably, these use no human labels, so you know they're completely naturally occurring. Um, but what if um, instead of using these naturally occurring data sources, uh, we used something like uh, supervised training data for a task such as entailment? So the advantage, uh, this has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that the task may be more difficult um, and requires capturing uh, small nuances. So for example, in entailment, uh, we want to know whether two very similar sentences actually entail each other, don't entail each other, or contradict each other. So for example, this, the diff this might be the difference between having not or not having not in a sentence, right? So um, I, I do like, uh, I, I do like neural networks, I do not like neural networks, right? So um, the, the nice thing about this is this allows you to, um, if you have training data for this, this allows you to very, you know, to really focus in on the things that really matter to, you know, determine whether two sentences mean the same thing or not. Um, but the problem with this, obviously, is that if you need to manually create data in some way, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, the data becomes much smaller. Um, so the experimental results uh, use a BIOSTM plus max pooling. So um, this is a kind of nice uh, architecture um, that I don't think I've talked about a whole lot, but basically it's a bio-LSTM uh, 
uh, where at the very last layer you just do max pooling over the extracted representations. So the reason why, one reason why this is good is it kind of gets rid of the problem that if you just use the final state of the by LSTM, uh, you have a very weak feedback signal to the things in the middle of the, uh, of the sentence because you've gone through a bunch of LSTM steps uh, between there. So um, it's a simple, uh, a simple kind of architecture tweak that allows you to get good uh, representations for sentences. But you know, that's not the important part of this work. Um, but the data they used was uh, the Stanford uh, Natural Language Inference uh, data set in the multi-genre uh, multi natural language inference data set. These were all created by mechanical Turk workers and are kind of like moderately sized. Um, I think there are uh, maybe over 100,000 examples, but not more than that. Um, and the interesting thing about this paper is basically they say, um, they show that this tends to be better than unsupervised objectives, uh, such as the skip thought vectors, uh, despite the fact that these unsupervised objectives are trained on much more data. Um, so they didn't actually compare with the like para uh, paraphrase based model, so it's kind of hard to say which one is better, but this is another uh, good one that you could uh, certainly consider. Um, my impression about this is that um, I'm a little bit nervous about this because it might not be trained on, you know, all of the different types of uh, data that you might want to be uh, interested in. And, you know, if you don't have the labels, then you're stuck, right? We don't have the labels for Twitter. If we don't have the labels for Twitter, then we're in trouble. So. Um, that's the difficulty with this, but it, you know, it's certainly something to have in your, in your toolbox of ways to learn embeddings. Um, are there any questions about uh, sentence representations or the, yes? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I know they at least did sentence similarity tasks and I think they did a couple other, uh, a couple other tasks as well. They did sentence similarity, paraphrase identification, and maybe a couple other things. I don't, I don't, exactly remember what they did. Anything else? Okay, great. So now, um, I, I think this, the sentence representations are very interesting. Um, they're, they're also nice uh, to kind of have as something that you can use across languages. Um, you can do multilingual training of them and stuff, which I'll be talking about later. Um, but kind of the really exciting and interesting development recently is uh, contextualized uh, word representations. And the idea behind contextualized word representations is instead of one vector per sentence, we have one vector per word. Um, so, yeah, actually, sorry, this isn't a super a super good example of how you would use contextualized word representations, but. Um, uh, the nice thing about contextualized word representations is you can use them for tagging, you can use them for parsing, you can use them for anything where you would be using a word embedding um, uh, because you have one vector for each word essentially. And you can also use them for sentence classification if you have some sort of thing that takes in, um, that takes in uh, you know, sequences of vectors and does sentence classification. Um, so how do we train this? Um, and Again, there's kind of a, a seminal work in this field. I think this was kind of the first work that did this. This is a paper that uh, should also get much more love. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny how the first paper in this, uh, in each of these strings of work is kind of under underrepresented or undersighted, but that's what you get for being before your time. Um, and so their model um, is basically a by, by LSTM, uh, which you already know what that is. Um, their objective is pre predicting a word uh, given the context. So the, the method is simple. Uh, you run a backward LSTM up until directly before the word. You run a forward LSTM up until directly, uh, sorry, you run a backward LSTM up until directly after the word. You run a forward LSTM up until directly before the word. You concatenate the two vectors. You run them through an MLP and you predict the, uh, you predict the word embedding. Um, so basically, you know, from context, you're predicting the word that's in the middle. Um, they trained this on the two billion word uh, UK WAC corpus. So uh, this is a different corpus than a lot of people uh, a lot of people use, but it's a, um, a corpus of UK English. Um, and then downstream, uh, they use the vectors for sentence completion, word sense disambiguation, uh, etc. Lots of other things. So the idea is super simple. 
Um, and I, I think it's similar to a lot of the things that we, uh, that we have already. Um, uh, so I, I think it's a good thing, a good method to know about. Um, the, uh, the next piece of work in this line of work um, is instead of using a language modeling objective, they directly use a machine translation objective. And the machine translation objective, whoops, sorry, my animation broke. But the machine translation objective is pretty simple. Um, you train an attentional uh, sequence to sequence model uh, where you use the encoder. And the encoder basically um, you know, learns to encode the sentence to do decoding. Um, and then you take this encoder and you use a, um, uh, uh, and then you feed this into a, um, a task specific model. And specifically, they did this for things like natural language inference and other uh, pairwise uh, um, like classification tasks. And basically, they, um, they ran a, uh, something they called a by attention network, uh, where they basically did uh, something similar to self attention over the encoded sequences um, it, to do sentence classification. And basically, what they show is that this uh, type of pre training is very effective uh, within. Uh, within this uh, paradigm. So um, this is kind of an alternate, uh, an alternate objective. The underlying model is exactly the same. It's a bidirectional LSTM. The only difference is the, um, is the training data that they used. They used English German translation data and the training objective that they used. So um, then a, a next a uh, piece of work um, is the bidirectional language modeling objective. Um, and uh, this is uh, used in ELMO, so I think a lot of people might be familiar with this. Um, it's a multi-layer uh, bidirectional uh, LSTM. And uh, the, language, the objective is essentially just two language modeling objectives added together. There's one left to right language modeling objective, and then there's one right to left language modeling objective. Um, so uh, you have a bio LSTM going from left to right that predicts the next word, a bio LSTM that's going from right to left that predicts the next word, um, and then you just train both of these. You could actually, uh, I think as far as I, I know, you could train them essentially independently except for the fact that the word embeddings are tied between the two models. So, um, uh, so this, is the, uh, this is the model here. One big innovation that they did have in this um, was that they have um, they don't do fine tuning of the whole model itself. Um, so one of the nice things about this is you can run Elmo essentially once over your entire corpus, extract the, uh, the vectors and just like cache the vectors and use them uh, in downstream tasks. But one big uh, innovation that they have is they have the representations from each of the layers and then they do a linear combination of the representations from each of the layers that then allows you to um, to take like the information that's useful from each layer for each task. And the reason why this is kind of a, an interesting thing is because the um, you know, previous work has kind of showed that the lower layers might encode more uh, syntactic information, uh, upper layers might encode information that looks more semantic. So then depending on the task you want to solve, you choose which one uh, you want to use more. So um, essentially, uh, and this is uh, trained on the one billion uh, word uh, benchmark language modeling data set. So um, a, next, uh, a next piece of work that people have done, uh, which also was in the recommended reading, but I'll go through it uh, just in case people didn't do the reading uh, because there was no uh, strong forcing function to make you do it this time, um, is uh, basically unidirectional training plus a transformer-based model. So the, um, the model itself is masked self-attention. So this is very similar to the transformer that we talked about in last class on attention. Um, the training method is exactly the same as the, uh, the training method is exactly the same as the, uh, the Dai and Lei paper that I talked about from 2015. It's just a language modeling objective uh, from left to right. Um, it's trained on the books corpus. So the, the data is different. 
So essentially, this is the same objective used in the kind of original paper that I was talking about, but they changed the underlying model. Um, so this is a, a diagram of it here. Um, for some, ta um, actually, I realize now that I, I put this in the wrong section. This should be in the previous section where uh, about sentence embeddings, because essentially they only really tested this on uh, sentence classification tasks, where you use the, sec the final, um, uh, you use the final uh, uh, state to do the sentence classification task, and that's part of the reason why they can get away with a left to right model, right? So. Um, the reason why you can get away with a left-to-right model is because you can take the final right state and use that to do sentence classification. Um, whereas if you actually want to contextualize word representation, something bidirectional is probably very important. Um, are there any questions uh, up until this point or any things people would like me to discuss? Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, where are the character convolutions applied in the Elmo? So, th um, sorry, this is a, uh, yeah, sorry, this is yet another dimension along which, uh, along which these models uh, vary. Um, so, yeah, I, I forgot to mention this, and I realize now that you asked the question uh, that this is important. And the question was, um, where are the character convolutions used um, within Elmo? So basically, each of these also, another kind of modeling choice that you have is how you represent words. And um, most of the previous works that I talked about represented words by looking up a word embedding. But as I talked about in, in the word embedding lecture, there's lots of other options that you can use, right? So you can use um, uh, character convolutions to, uh, to create a word embedding, which is what Elmo does. Uh, you could use a character bag of words objective to get the word embeddings. Um, or you could run fast text, which uses a character bag of words objective, um, and then feed this in, uh, which would allow you to use subword information. Um, or like BERT, you can use uh, subwords. So all of these are completely independent of the additional model architecture choice that I had up here. Um, but it's yet another dimension along which these models vary and makes them, you know, uh, Hard to compare, I guess, if you uh, if you just compare the papers. So in the capital letter convolutions, do they uh, differentiate between capital and small letters and, uh, and does that matter? Um, do you differentiate between capital and small letters when you do character level models? And that's a very good question. And the answer is, um, especially if you're using a character level model, you definitely should do that. And the reason why is because capitalization is a really strong signal in uh, in English about part of speech about whether something's a named entity, uh, et cetera. So um, if you're using a character level convolution model, that's actually excellent because you know um, the character level convolution model can learn that basically capital B and small b are essentially the same character except for the fact that they're you know, capitalized. So um, you definitely should maintain capitalization. Um, if you're not using a character level model, it's not quite as clear. In that case, you might want to lowercase everything. Um, and the reason why is because capitalization will add sparsity. Um, so if you get a capital, um, if you get a capital Bush, B-U-S-H, and a lowercase Bush, these will be learned independently. And if you haven't seen enough training examples for them, you might not realize that, you know, in some cases, capital Bush does mean the same thing as lowercase Bush. So um, that's, a, that's a big advantage of character level models, actually. Um, any other questions? Yes. So in the original Elmo, it it's includes both. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, we, we had confirmation that the original Elmo does distinguish between uppercase and lowercase. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure, well, I'm, I won't say I'm sure, but you know, that, that's, in this case, it's the obvious modeling decision to do. Like, I, I can't think of a case where lowercasing would be a good idea. Um, 
if, as long as you're using a character level model. Notably, BERT does not use a character level model, so they do actually provide, uh, they do actually provide uppercase and lowercase versions. Uh, so I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so um, now I will, I will move on to you know, what, maybe what everybody was waiting for. So I'll, I'll talk about BERT. Um, I think talking about BERT in the, in the context of all the other ones uh, is actually very useful um, because there's a lot of things that are very similar, um, but there's a few things that are a little bit different and very clever. And most of the slightly different but very clever things are mostly related to training the model efficiently uh, as opposed to really like novel, um, uh, you know, like architecture changes. But the they're clever things, and as a result, it's very efficient to train this model. So I think it's, uh, it's worth realizing why they made these de design decisions the way they did. So BERT um, essentially is a multi-layer self-attention. It's a transformer model underneath. Um, but they have a few small modifications to the input um, that allow you to do some, uh, some nice things. So uh, one thing that BERT uh, does is it, it allows you to input uh, sentence pairs. Um, and between each sentence, you have a, a separation, sorry, a, a separator token. Uh, so you know, this uh, can separate two sentences. Um, you also have this classification token at the very beginning of the sentence. Um, and uh, like most self-attentional models, you have, um, uh, you have uh, positional embeddings, you have uh, token embeddings, and then unlike, uh, you know, unlike other self-attentional models, you have, uh, you have which segment this came from. So this allows you to naturally model uh, sentence pairs. Um, the model itself is just uh, multi-layer self-attention, uh, nothing, really, nothing really special about the model. Um, with one caveat that they use uh, subword representations, and um, subword representations basically uh, split up uh, low frequency words into kind of uh, chunks. So if you have like play and ing, um, you, uh, you would split this into two words. And this is a pre-processing step that you do before actually modeling uh, sentences. Um, there was a question about casing, which is a, still a very good question. Um, in, in BERT, uh, they actually provide an uppercase model and a lowercase model, and I think this is for a very good reason. Um, if you're not uh, using a character-based model, um, it's very possible that you would have playing be split into a single word, and then you have play, uh, upper, uppercase play split into two words uh, like this, just because they vary by one capital character. And this seems like a big problem, right? You know, like if you have playing and playing, probably you want them to be, you know, the same granularity after you do segmentation. And this is a common problem uh, when you're when you're doing some sort of subword segmentation. Um, I'm I'm certain that the uh, that the authors of BERT know about character convolutions. You know, they're they're smart. They're good NLP people. The reason why they chose, I'm sure the reason why they chose not to do that is simply for efficiency purposes. It's much more efficient uh, to segment uh, words into pieces uh, before running them through your model than it is to run a separate character convolution over each of the words in the input. Uh, so probably if you had character convolutions, you would get a better model, but it just would be slower to train. So um, uh, no, nobody's tried this. You know, you could try this and see what and see what happens, but um, uh, I, I'm pretty certain that that's the reason why they did that. Um, the the na the next um, thing is the training objective. So this is a the training objective for this is essentially context to vec plus skip thought. Uh, so it has two training objectives. One is the kind of like context to vec predict word in context one. The other one is next sentence prediction. But for both of these, um, they did it in a way that would be very efficient. Um, and they, the kind of like innovation here is how they chose to do these, uh, like train these objectives in a way that would allow them to train efficiently. Um, so I'll go through each of these. Um, they also trained on the books corpus and English Wikipedia, which means they have more data than 
Elmo, for example, or uh, OpenAI GPT. Um, so who knows, maybe, maybe more data is helping here uh, as well. Um, oh, they also have like 12 layers in their big, um, you know, in, in their models. So 12 layers can't, couldn't hurt either. Um, so the masked word predi prediction objective is um, basically what you do is for 15% of the words, which is a hyperparameter, obviously, but they used 15% in their uh, method here. For 15% of the words, you mask out the input word and basically corrupt it. So what this is like is this is a, uh, essentially a denoising autoencoder um, where uh, you add noise to the input and you try to recover the original sentence in the output. Um, the, uh, for 10, uh, 80 percent of the time you substitute the input word with mask, which is basically, um, you know, a, a fixed vector, uh, that, uh, um, that is not, uh, the word 10 percent of the time you can substitute the input word with a random other word. Um, and then 10 percent of the time you do no change. Um, I'm actually not hundred percent sure why this like 10 percent of the time. Oh yeah. 10 percent of the time, no change. Um, so like, uh, and the reason for this is essentially because you would like to kind of bias the, uh, the model towards predicting something similar to the input, uh, uh, when it, when it is warranted. So 10% of the time you have, uh, you have this. Um, so the reason why they did this, um, instead of a bi-directional training objective or a masked bi-directional training objective is this is really, really nice for the case where you have multi-layer self-attention. Um, so if you just had, um, what you could do is you could, um, you could essentially mask out each of the individual segments of the, uh, you could mask out each of the individual word, um, words uh, that you want to predict in a left to right model. Uh, like you do in the uh, in the decoder for the transformer based model, but the problem with this is basically you have to calculate essentially n times for a single sentence where at each of the n steps you 're masking out um, all of the all of the words that follow the um, all of the words that follow a uh, a particular word so if you remember from the uh, if you remember from the self-attention lecture last time, we essentially have a mask that looks like um, that looks like this, where you mask out you know all the previous words and then do self-attention uh, over this. And the problem with this is, every time you apply this mask, you're you know adding more computation. You're adding another pass through all of the layers of the model. Um, and if you just mask individual words, if you mask 15% of the words in the sentence uh, or something like that, this means that you don't need to do each of the kind of masks individually. You can do all of them at the same time and just make the appropriate, uh, make the appropriate predictions uh, based on this. So uh, the nice thing is now you only have to do a single computation through all of your self-attention layers uh, for the entire sentence instead of you know, doing a single doing masking for each, each one of these. So this is an efficiency trick, but it's a very effective one and very well-motivated one uh, based on the fact that you're, you're using self-attention. Um, so um, are there any questions about this? Okay. So the second, um, the second one is consecutive sentence prediction. Um, so this is um, like the... Uh, it's like the um, uh, the skip thought vector method essentially, where you are um, you're taking one sentence and you're predicting the next sentence, but the difference here is instead of actually trying to output the entire next sentence and predict the entire uh, uh, predict all of the words in the next sentence. What you are doing is you're just predicting whether the next sentence is a true next sentence or not, or a false next sentence that you have uh, um, that you've like negative sampled from you know other possibilities. <coughs> and this is also um, an efficiency trick. Uh, the reason why it's an efficiency trick is this allows you to encode both of these sentences at the same time, so you don't need to mask out 
um, this sentence when you, uh, when you do the prediction. Another thing is that this is very nice when you want to do transfer to other kind of like sentence pair tasks. Like if you want to do entailment, um, you want to do paraphrase identification or something else uh, downstream because you're essentially training a sentence pair classifier um, out of the box. Uh, or you're training a sentence pair classifier during the whole, uh, the whole um, process of doing pre-training. And specifically how you do this, you have this extra CLS token and you take the vector that you get in uh, corresponding to the CLS token, and then you use this to try to make this prediction through you know, a, a binary classifier, essentially. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is um, the training objective that you have for BERT. And I think um, this is really um, the, the really big innovations here are kind of the, the ways to train this efficiently, and I, I think these are really kind of uh, interesting. And of course, the results speak for themselves. That's why, honestly, I don't think the methodological novelty is why people are so excited about this. It's just because it works really well. But um, the, uh, the methodological novelty is there and, and interesting as well. So I, I wanted to say that, uh, to, you know, uh, stress that too. Um, so uh, there's a couple ways you can use BERT or, or anything else. So for, um, uh, for things like uh, sentence pair classification, you can just uh, feed in both sec sentences separated by the SEP signal, uh, symbol and uh, try to predict the class label from here. Uh, you do fine tuning. Um, uh, for single sentence classification, you just feed in a single um, you feed in a single sentence with no separator and do uh, fine tuning uh, with this class label. Um, for things like uh, question answering, um, like squad, uh, which we'll talk about more later, um, you can basically make a prediction about the start and end span and see whether this is a uh, uh, this is an appropriate thing. So you can put like a question here and uh, a paragraph here and uh, try to classify the, the start and end of the answer to the question. Um, and for things like tagging, then you just take in the vector for each of these uh, things and you, you make a prediction based on that. Um, so uh, generally, basically, when you, when you do these, you think of BERT as the first layer in your model um, because the, uh, the pre-training gives you very strong representations. You can actually use a very simple model like an MLP to do the final classification. Um, but, uh, or you know, you could put a more complicated model on top of it. You could put a parser on top of it uh, that uses some sort of structured prediction algorithm, et cetera. Um, you can also just use BERT or just about anything else uh, to calculate pre-trained representations and freeze the model itself. Uh, the advantage of this is that then during training, you don't need to rerun uh, this huge monster of a model uh, every time you're, you're doing a gradient step. Uh, so if you just calculate the vectors and then fine tune using these vectors, uh, a model using these vectors, and that works uh, quite well as well. Um, are, are there any questions about this or? Yes. So when we extract the like, token representation, mm -hmm. would we be extracting um, the vectors for every single word to be independent, or just, for example, obviously you can take the vectors to have, but for mm -hmm. example, So, so when you're extracting the, pre, this is a good question. When you're extracting the pre-trained representations, would you extract all of them uh, for every word in the sentence? Or would you maybe just extract the one for the classification token that you had there? I think it really depends on your model, on your downstream model. I think most interesting models would require you to look at the individual words of the sentence. So you would probably save them, uh, save each word of the sentence. The good thing about this is you can do it in a NumPy array. Um, it'd be lots of, big NumPy arrays, but you know, um, it might be significantly more efficient to do that. You're basically trading off disk space uh, for, for computation, uh, which might be a good trade-off depending on your you know, resource environments, I guess. Um, any other questions? What, what if you have one, one uh, sentence? What happens if you only have the one sentence that you're putting in for your task? Oh, what, what happens if you only have one sentence that you're feeding in? And that, that's actually the thing on the top right here. 
Um, so basically, you just feed in a single sentence, and um, you you only have uh, you don't have like the separator token. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just don't use it. Okay, so um, I, I think the uh, the question one question that this boils down to is which method is better. Um, the the short answer to this question is, if you're not going to be training this yourself, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, you just download a model, um, or maybe download a couple models, you try them, and then you use the one that works best. Um, however, in many cases, you could think about very realistic scenarios where you know none of these models will suit your needs. Like, Let's say you want to do this for another language uh, that's not English. Uh, let's say you want to do this for um, a different domain where BERT has not seen this in its training data. And in that case, you really it would be a good idea to know about the methods um, themselves and know about the, the different features of them, which one should you be using. Um, so the question about which model is better, um, from, a, uh, you know, from a modeling perspective, unfortunately, there is not a very extensive comparison of these models. Uh, as I said, people tend to create BERT and tend to create ELMO and then compare BERT versus ELMO where the model is different, the training objective is different, and the data is different. So, you know, we don't really have in a very good understanding of this. Um, so as I mentioned before, Weeding et al. found that simple uh, word averaging uh, works better for out of domain even if LSTMs look good on the data that they were trained on. Um, so this is a very nice comparison, although it's a bit old and, uh, you know, uh, three-year-old on a three-year-old method. Um, Devlin et al. Uh, do have an ablation where they compare unidirectional and bidirectional uh, transformers. Um, so this, uh, but they don't have a comparison to an LSTM uh, like ELMO. Um, I, I think one good argument for why they didn't do this is because L, uh, an L ELMO style L LSTM is probably harder to train. It's definitely harder to train on TPUs, which like Google likes to use. Um, so uh, if you're hardware bound into something that's very efficient but can only do matrix multiplies efficiently, uh, then you know, that limits the class of bottles that you're able to test. So that, I, I think they have a good excuse for not, uh, for not comparing with this, but still it would be interesting to see. Um, within the realm of machine translation, it turns out that LSTMs work just as well uh, is self-attention, if not better, uh, on the decoding side. Um, but you know, uh, performance is a very good uh, is a very good um, like measure or very good thing to think about. Uh, which training objective should you use? Um, there's also not a very extensive comparison here. Unfortunately, this is going to be a theme. Um, uh, one, one nice comparison, um, unfortunately this is a very short paper, it was just a workshop paper, uh, four pages, uh, but by Zing and Bowman, um, control for training data and find that um, bidirectional LMs seem to be better than machine translation encoders um, uh, for pre-training representations. And I think this is really an interesting result. Um, and the reason why the, it's an interesting result is language models only require monolingual data Whereas machine translation requires bilingual data. You should feel like you have a stronger training signal from machine translation, right? Does anyone have an idea why this is the case? The languages are very different. Um, the, uh, like between English and German, that might be the case. Um, size of the data, no, because they controlled for the size and the type of the data. Um, any, any other ideas? What, what's that? Syntactic structure of the languages. Um, I would actually argue that if you have different syntactic structure that actually make the pre-training objective better, potentially. Um, and the reason why is because you're making the training task harder. And I feel like harder training tasks lead to better pre-trained representations. Um, this is kind of anecdotal, but I, I think it's probably true. Um, and if you go back to like topic classification versus sentiment classification, um, uh, you can think that a pre-trained sentiment encoder will only learn the very minimal amount of uh, 
We'll only learn the very minimal amount of information that you need in order to do sentiment classification, which might be just identifying positive or negative words, right? So this is a very relatively simple objective for sentiment classification. And similarly, if you have machine translation between English and French, which has very similar word order, this will be easier than English and Chinese, for example, which has very different word order, lots more um, like uh, word sense amb ambiguity and stuff like this. So if you wanted to learn the syntactic structure or, um, or word senses, you probably would be better off with English Chinese as a training objective, for example. Um, so uh, to kind of give away uh, the reason why I think this is the case, I think actually um, the encoder part of machine translation is only one part of the model, right? In addition to the encoder part, you also have a decoder. And the decoder is actually arguably more important than the encoder. So the decoder is learning a very strong language model on the decoder side. So if you're using MT to train representations, you're actually throwing out the decoder. You're throwing out a large part of the action in the MT model. Um, so I think um, the fact that you need to learn everything with the LM as opposed to where you just need to learn like enough in order to get your decoder to work well for MT might be a good explanation for this. So actually, if you could think of a way to make the encoding task or the multilingual task harder um, such that the encoder would really need to work well in order for you to solve it, you might be able to get better uh, representations from this bilingual uh, signal. Um, so this is a free course project if, uh, if, <laughs> if somebody wants to try that as well. Although I said it on videos that I'm putting on YouTube, so you need to be careful that somebody, uh, <laughs> somebody else doesn't do it before your, your course project. Um, so uh, the next, um, Devlin et al. actually uh, compare their model with the next sentence prediction objective uh, and without. And they find that with only the LM objective, they do pretty well. But the, um, the next sentence prediction objective is definitely helping uh, quite a bit. So uh, that's another one. Um, which data? Um, again, not a very extensive comparison between these. Um, but again, Zhang and Bowman did a, a, quite a good job um, for, uh, considering that it's a very short paper. And they find that more data is probably better, but the results are somewhat preliminary. They don't, uh, they don't do a really extensive comparison of this. But um, uh, how do domain effects, are there domain effects? Are there other you know, things like this? So that's another uh, interesting question that we don't have an answer for. Um, one thing that we can say is data with uh, surrounding sentence context is probably essential. So we probably need this to train a good model. So, yep, that's all I have for today. Um, are there any final questions? Or? Well, I guess, I guess it's, it's past time, so I'll, I'll finish up and if there are questions. Um, Dan, Dan has uh, quizzes, so if you want to pick up your, your quiz.